uh, symposium on oncology and hematology. Thank you, Dr. Nagua, for the kind invitation and Dr. Yazid for the introduction. Um, it is my job today to discuss with you, to share some topics on the, uh, on the lessons of COVID-19, not so much uh, specific lessons from where I speak from, I'm speaking from Portugal, general lessons that we all can learn from, some perspectives, something that I would be happy to discuss with you in the questions and answers moment in a while. So this is the organization I have today. In fact, today I have two presentations, one now and one uh, uh, near the end of the symposium. Uh, and I have organized uh, in this uh, nice way, things felt like this, uh, my, my two presentations. So firstly, I will speak about basically about people, about the impact that COVID has had on people, the, those being the patients, of course, but also the staff. I will speak about the impact of COVID-19 on the organization of care, the organization of hospital institutions, in payers and uh, all the stakeholders in the value chain of healthcare. Then the other topics will be for the uh, last presentation. So starting with the topic of people and thinking of the impact that COVID-19 has had on uh, staff and patients, the main thing, the thing that we have observed beyond the pandemia moment was that things went better, things improved faster, the infection rates were lower where patients were more educated, where we had health literacy in general, and we had a good doses of education of the public in regards to the safety measures, in regard to the nature of the disease, in regard to the things that they could be doing or could not be doing when they were close to, a, to, a, to an infected relative, when they could go to a hospital or not. So educating patients was a lesson from this disease. And I think it can be used for all the other disease areas. We do have a lot of advantages, even in complying with treatments, with uh, being preventive in regard to illness, uh, cooperating with authorities. We have a lot of advantages in having educated people, especially educated patients, health literacy, so it's an area of investment. It has been proved to work in this case of COVID-19. But when we educate people on healthcare and on the things they should do, they will start looking with different eyes into healthcare providers. They will start to want to discuss the health measures, the health treatment. They will want to know more about the disease and the available treatments and they will form an opinion on health institutions, on hospitals, maybe on individual practices as well. And that's why I have it there as consumerism. It means that the patient will be much more active in uh, deciding what's important, what counts for him, what he wants from the healthcare system in the future. But that's, that's only a consequence of the most important thing, which is to educate patients and promote health uh, literacy. One other topic that um, will affect patients and will affect staff in the near future has to do with the load of diseases. Uh, cancer, autoimmune diseases, heart diseases, road accidents, they have not disappeared. But in fact, we have not been talking a lot about them. The fact is that COVID-19 took all of our attention and the other disease areas have not. What's happening out there with these diseases? I think the, the load of these diseases is increasing. I will speak in a while about delays in treatment and the consequences of that. But one important consequence has to do with mental disease. We will probably have a surge in mental disease, namely on depressions and related diseases, and we will have to be prepared for that. It's also another sort of epidemics, also another sort of um, serious illness, life-threatening illness that we, we will need in the hospitals to be, to be attentive and to pay attention to in the near future. So do prepare for that because there will be an upgrade in, uh, and even on staff having gone through burnout syndromes and things like that. 
So to finish this slide, just one more note. When you educate patients, they not only become more involved and wish to become more involved in care, but we have to supply them with information for that. And they will also become more cooperative in disease, uh, in treatments, uh, which means that we can ask patients to give data back to the hospital. We can ask patients to report on how they feel with treatments. We can ask patients not just about, did you enjoy the experience? How happy were you? Are you a promoter of our hospital? We can also ask patients on their experience on individual drugs. A bit like in clinical trial, except now it's in, in a real world setting, and we will be able to use that data for real world studies, which is a nice thing and a, an investment on the future of the healthcare system and of the uh, specific practices where we operate. Some other topics still relating to people and to their role inside healthcare provider, healthcare payers, or even research institutions. A very important one, and that's why I chose this picture where we have clinical staff speaking to non-clinical staff. It's about interaction. We haven't had a lot of it during the confinement. We haven't had a lot of it with our patients, and certainly not with the families of patients because the number of people that could enter hospitals was seriously uh, controlled for. We did rely on digital health, and digital health is certainly an area of investment and future, and it's a promising area for teleconferencing, tele-appointments, things like that, but also, and very important, to provide care at home for patients. For example, to control for follow-up procedures, to uh, provide some care, for example, in dialysis, for example, in managing uh, neutropenias for cancer patients, for example, in doing checkups, pre-surgical checkups, in discussing post-treatment questions with patients. There are certainly a number of situations where we can avoid, and we do have a lot of advantages in avoiding for the future, beyond the COVID-19 crisis, the coming of patients uh, to hospitals. So we can still foster interaction with the digital tools in several areas, true. Still, those would be 20 to 30% of the operations of the hospital. We still have 70 to 80% of the operations of the hospital where we can have interaction, but we, have, we must have live interaction with patients. And that's what we have been missing during these two or three months of confinement. So we will have a delay in activity, and there may have been consequences for our patients regarding follow-ups or even regarding earlier diagnosis. And interaction is also important to build trust with our patients. Patients keep coming to our hospitals, especially in a context where they can go to other hospitals. They don't need to come to ours unless they really like our services. Um, and patients need to trust us. They need to trust us to do the prescribed treatment, and they need to trust us to keep coming to our hospital and to make us part of their lives whenever they need to. So how do we convince patients to come back to the hospital? How do we convince patients that we have safe places? We have to do the things that are in our contingency plans, and we must communicate that to patients. I know of a lot of initiatives that have been performed in the Gulf area, in Saudi Arabia specifically, for example, and because I know our audience today has a lot of pharmacists, not only, but a lot of pharmacists. We know about, for example, the, the drive-in pharmacies to, to pick up medications, things like that. They were meant to have the patient complying with treatments, having trust with the hospital, and not putting himself and the others in further danger. So a lot of things were done in order to build trust. Maybe some of the people who were doing that were not thinking it, of it in this way, but the most important thing between a physician and a patient, a hospital and a patient, it's about trust. I trust that you will do at home what you're supposed to do, and you trust that I can provide you with the best advice and the best treatments uh, for your condition. So it's about maintaining a healthy relationship between us, providers, and our clients, the patients, and the families. At the same time, uh, we have to do 
an important thing in our hospital. We have to build what I call, and other colleagues have called, a dual hospital. The pandemic came up without early warning. The pandemic came up with um, an emergency, a great level of demand from our hospital. And we had to cancel a lot of activity. We had to send a lot of patients home and we had to build a second hospital on top of the hospital. This second hospital was the COVID hospital, was the um, intensive care unit, was the uh, wards, was the pharmacy, and was all those corridors, all those procedures that were aiming at sustaining the activity of fighting uh, COVID. Of course, we would have to support this uh, dual hospital at the same time that we were at the same time that we were uh, operating the normal procedures. We have to keep this hospital running at the same time as we are delivering babies, at the same time that we are providing the uh, care uh, to cancer patients. And why am I talking about this right now? We know that in, in a few months we will have a vaccine and we will be waving goodbye to COVID-19. At least we believe so. Uh, because this idea of the dual hospital is important to keep in mind for the future. For the future, we have learned that we need more flexibility. At least in the European hospitals that I know better, they were already crowded. They were already overstaffed. They were already on the maximum of their activity levels. That was the answer to achieving high levels of efficiency and also providing assistance to a growing number of patients. So how come we were able to take this wave of COVID-19 patients? Of course, in a panic move, in an urgent setting, we sent some patients away and we saved some space and some, and some time from the HR to these COVID-19 patients. But it can't be that for the future. For the future, we need the flexibility to go and pick up these new patients for, from the next pandemic, from something horrible like an earthquake or something like that. And we need to be able to incorporate this extra care to be able to build a, a second hospital on top of the existing one and still keep the activity going for the normal hospital. Uh, we did not learn completely how to do this, but some hospitals did very well, and now it's the time to learn how they did it. How did you hire more staff? Where did you get your equipment from? How did you manage the other patients that you sent away? What did you do with them? Did you postpone for two months? or only for two days the care they were needing? How did you manage to do that? So all these questions, I would say that after the COVID-19 crisis, it's not the time to shut this as a memory, never to think of it again. It's time to think that certainly not COVID-19, but other diseases may arise in the future or the earthquake or something like that. And we need to have the uh, flexibility, ability to hire more staff quickly uh, and to change uh, the offer of our hospital within a few weeks and then come back to normal again uh, without exhausting the hospital staff and without endangering the other the other patients moving forward here ah, one uh, one last word for healthcare professionals they need to be attended not only because of burnout but because at least where i come from in europe some hospital professions they were underappreciated at least in terms of salary and things like that. And here we will have to pay a, an attention in the future regarding the, um, regarding the way some staff is paid. And uh, because namely in public acknowledgement, they become highly appreciated thing that they were not so much in the past. So we will now take off from the dual hospital of COVID into the future, into taking on future levels of activity while keeping safety measures for the next six months to a year before we have the, uh, the vaccine. So in the short term, how are we going to do it in the hospitals? How have we been doing? We build those emergency facilities, we converted the infrastructures, 
and there has been a lot of impact in the other diseases because less surgeries, less treatments, and less drugs being used on patients. Still, did we save money with that? No, we still spent a lot of money. We spent all the budget, in fact. Uh, how can we do that? Well, basically on inefficiency. It's obvious that when you reorganize, reshift the hospital operation into something that it was not programmed to be, you will be spending a lot more money than you should. Uh, so that would be an inefficiency. Uh, you did attend, and you did attend with the best possible care, the COVID-19 patients, except that uh, it's July now, and you've probably run out of your budget for a year or close to that. So the money has been spent. We will, in the future, in the near future or short term one, we'll need to talk about money, about reinforcing the budget of hospitals, because um, we had this surprise. We were not expecting, we had to deal with it in the best possible way, but still that was very expensive in the direct terms. And then there's the indirect bill, but that's for the rest of the, uh, the economy. Of course, we also spent a lot of money attending directly the COVID-19 patients and managing the prevention activities and education activities. All of that was important, but now we will no longer discuss the treatments, that's up to the professionals. We need now at least the managers to discuss the budgeting and the financing of the rest of the year and of next year's budgets. For the medium term, we need to rebuild everything. For the medium term, things have um, passed, uh, things have evolved, and we have to recover our traditional activity. We have to get back to treating patients, to treating cancer, to treating, to sending the patients to the dentist, to sending patients to the dermatologist, to having patients to go into plastic surgery, to have patients going into GI, all the activity, diagnosis, etc., all the activity that was postponed. And uh, well, what, where are those professionals? How can they get back to their patients as soon as possible? How can they take in the two month delay of patients and keep treating the new ones? Things like that. We have to go to that discussion as soon as possible. Our mission is to attend patients in the best possible way, and that's where we have to go back to. We need to learn to become more flexible. We did talk about that a while ago, and I want to emphasize that. For the future hospital structures, we cannot be, we cannot be strict, tough. As we were, as we used to work, we need to work in a more flexible way. Professionals need to work in team, in multidisciplinary team. We need to be aware that we may have to shift our activities from one day to the other. Our revenues in terms of hospital, now you think not only about your service, think of the hospital as a whole. Our revenues, because these are companies, we have to pay our bills. These are companies that we have not been able to compensate from the COVID-19 revenues, our costs. They barely cover the cost of treatment. And certainly they do not cover the costs of the staff, of the facilities that we have, we have hired and we have not used to take care of patients. So we will have huge losses this year. It will be a year not only of losses in the airline companies, in banks, in insurance companies, but also in hospitals. Thank God we have the reserves from previous years, but um, we have to recover and get back to normal as soon as possible. This is not good news for the economy. It's certainly not good news for us employees. But we will recover and overcome that, the economic pandemic, which is the wave after the uh, virus pandemic. Now, because there's no money and because we have a lot of things to do, we will have what we call competition for resources. We will see in hospitals, staff, physicians, directors, asking for beds for their patients, asking for the operating room for their patients, asking for resources to attend their needs. But everyone will be asking for this at the same time. So hospital managers, hospital board, we will have to sort a lot of, I wouldn't say conflict, but at least to sort out this competition for resources that we are going to watch in the near future in our hospitals. Everyone will be asking for means to attend and do their job. We will also have certain emphasis on traditional tools of management, such as lean management, operational efficiency, etc. 
everything will be useful at this stage. One last word for you, mainly pharmacists, but also the others involved in hospital logistics. We have learned the value, well, ideally is the value of having a national industry in producing drugs, in producing devices. If we cannot have that, and we cannot certainly have that, the world is a global place, um, we will have to start thinking about stockpiling a little bit more into strategic reserves. Strategic reserves for the country and strategic reserves for the hospital. Some hospitals have very quickly, very early on, run out of devices, run out of drugs, and were borrowing from other hospitals. We're buying from international markets at incredible prices. We need to prepare. We know that we cannot forecast a crisis like this, but that's why we do risk assessment and scenario planning. And we, we do get to the, to the realization that we should have prepared, at least where I come from, we should have prepared better and have stock, stockages, stockpiling some resources would have been useful to, uh, well, be aware for some sort of disaster like this or, or any other one. So, to summarize, uh, we had a crisis, a crisis that was a serious hit on our supply chains, a crisis that was a severe hit on our HR abilities, that nearly drained out our physicians and our nurses providing care. Overall, in the end, we did have a good response all over the world, some countries sooner, some countries later. We will overcome this, but there will be there will be massive consequences to deal with. It's not just the short-term one, it's the medium-term one. And the challenge for hospital is how to reorganize and how to learn something from the crisis. It's the becoming more flexible, it's do, to organize in a different way so that I can face crisis in a quicker and faster way. And it's also about using the flexibility to provide better care for patients. You know, we have been talking when we talk about value-based care, healthcare, and the other things, you know that we talk about reorganizing into multidisciplinary teams, into flexible, agile settings. And that's why this crisis has some lessons that we can profit from. So I hope I have shared some of them with you and uh, I will be available for questions and discussions in this talk and in the future. Thank you very much.